Andrew P here from the Seven Figure Fitness Business Podcast, and I'm really excited to tell you about today's episode. So I was lucky enough to get Ruben Mewison, who is our superstar fitness closer, and he's honestly, without a doubt, the best high ticket fitness closer I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. And I've known some incredibly talented people in this space. Um, he's 26 years old. He's earning over 350K a year with us doing what he's doing. And we actually expect him to get over 400 next year based on his current rate. He closes with over 90% conversions a lot of the time. And he closes his calls in often less than 20 minutes. Um, he's making the company typically in terms of revenue over 70K per week. And that's for a two to three thousand dollar program. So some of these numbers are just astronomically good. Like it's hard to really understand how good these are. You're going to want to check this episode out if you are a fitness business owner, especially in the online space, whether you're the one making the calls yourself or whether you've got a sales team that you're looking to build or improve the culture and performance of. You also will find it fascinating if you're an aspiring salesperson who's just looking to improve your craft in that area. Um, you know, as always, we really appreciate your support listening to the episodes or watching them, whether it's on YouTube or whether it's on um, iTunes podcasts or Spotify or any other podcast platform, we'd really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe to the channel and leave us a positive review. Thank you and enjoy the episode. All right, Ruben, so let us know a little bit about you know, how your sales journey began. Yep, sounds good. Well, first podcast for me, so I must be moving up in the world, which is exciting to be invited on, a, on one of these things. Yeah, man. So sales, it's, it's something that I probably knew I was going to do from a very, very young age, selling items from home to the school kids you know, at a very young age. So it's probably something that I knew that I would be doing for quite a while, but didn't really fall into it until about sort of 17 or 18 when I finished my personal training course. And then, yeah, just obviously started training clients there, got really, really, really busy, obviously just through sort of selling. I, I wouldn't say I was a very good trainer, I'm also just a good salesperson. Mm -hmm. And then uh, moved into sort of, you know, managing a few different gyms and whatnot, and then into like sort of national sales manager. But then, yeah, I just obviously wanted to do, you know, my own thing and work my own hours and work remote and travel the world and all these great things that, you know, that I'm wanting to do, hence why I'm here with you guys. Yeah. Now, the thing that, you know, for anyone listening, what's going to be really intriguing, you know, and I think I really got to make a point of this is that I know a lot of people that do fitness sales and most of them are extremely good given, you know, the quality of our company and the people we associate with. But it's not an exaggeration to say that you're the best fitness sales person that I've ever met. And you're only 26 years old as well. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that are very intrigued about what makes someone like you tick. I'm really interested about how you've got yourself to the standard that you're at at such a relatively young age. Yeah, perfect, man. Appreciate that little pump up. <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of, I guess, myself, the fitness industry is like a non-negotiable for me. It's something that I need to be involved with. Sure. It's been opportunities to sell, you know, obviously real estate, do other things like that, move into to that sort of realm of, of sales, but it just wasn't for me. I don't necessarily sell because... You know, for me, it's just all, I guess, just about the, the money side of things. I just sell because I absolutely love the fitness industry. I love what we do. And then, yeah, obviously, the money is great on top of that. And again, just sort of the flexibility in the way that I've now been able to position myself to sort of have everything I've always ever wanted out of this industry, obviously, now working with you guys. What drives you though? Like, I mean, what are the things that you're actually working towards? Like, because you get out of bed every morning, it seems to be you've got a file lid under your ass. Like, not many people can do that at the level that you have. You know, there's an obsession there. Where does that come from? I think it comes through routine. So, you know, especially mm -hmm. like routine and obviously, you know, building up a future as well. Like, I definitely want to set myself up a very, very good future. I want to be very self sort of sufficient and. I just want to push myself every day, like every month. I always want to be, not even for the title, but I just want to be the highest performer, you know, in, in any company that I'm involved with. I want to be able to generate the most cash. I want to add the most value to the people that I work for. I want to add the most value to myself and monetize, you know, every sort of half an hour that I have. So that's probably where the motivation stems from, just to keep going, get it done every other day. And 
And for mine, there's not too many other interests that I've got outside of that. I, I can't really necessarily just sit down and watch a movie. Not that I don't want to. I just, I just don't enjoy that. You know, so for me, it's like I've got a really good foundation of my life. It works. Mm. It, I'm healthy. I make seriously good money and, you know, working in a great team, just doing what I love. So I think after 10 years of in the fitness industry, working for, for gyms with, you know, shitty quality leads and working in an office, working in, in a hot phone, hot booth with other people. And I just think when you get yourself to the position that I'm in now and, you know, you just want to keep going, you want to keep making as much as you can, you want to keep pushing it, you want to make sure that this sort of, this doesn't stop because, it, you know, it won't always last essentially. So that maybe that's why. Okay. No, it m- makes a lot of sense to me. Like, you know, th- your drive is really something that's impressed myself and, you know, AJ and, and Sheree, you know, our company CEO as well. And talk about having, you know, good cultures. We've talked about that on this show before. One of the things that we had was always a pretty decent sales team. It was a really good sales team, good bunch of people. But, you know, I always sort of have jokingly said, you kind of had that Roger Bannister effect, the guy that did the the four minute mile, you know, no one thought it was possible. And then in he comes and he does it. And then after that, you know, everyone starts breaking that record afterwards because it shows what can be done. It sets a different bar of expectation and standards now, when you came in for us, we had a pretty good sales process. We were closing usually in around about 40 minutes, probably about 70% conversions. And, you know, you sort of came in, started closing most of your calls in sort of less than 20 minutes. And initially, you know, your close rate just blew us away. You were closing comfortably over 80% every week and most weeks, even over 85 and 90. In doing that, I'm fascinated about how you come in and disrupt a culture like that and just do your thing and kind of change standards. Like, how do you, how do you even go about that? <laughs> I think it was a funny time, obviously, when I got involved with you guys. It was like, all right, well, let's give it a go. We, we all didn't really know what to expect. We've all sort of heard of each other in the fitness industry. But, yep. you know, I, I wasn't too happy with my sort of situation. We're still earning all right money, but it wasn't overwhelming. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I just know I've got more than this, essentially. Mm-hmm. And again, it goes back to me being in the fitness industry for 10 years, you know, working for multiple gyms. So you understand what you have to do as a salesperson to try and get mm-hmm. deals through, you know, otherwise you get a kick up the arse. So, so I come in a bit deflated, you know, come in with you guys a little bit deflated about my situation. I'm like, this is shit. This isn't, you know, I moved to Melbourne. I was meant to do this, that and that. And I was like, this is not how it was meant to be. Come in with you guys, pick up the phone from my little apartment in South Bank. Pick up the phone, close the deal in about 15 minutes. Yeah, I think at, at that point, the commissions were something like 250 bucks for that 15 minutes. And I was like, all right, here we go. So, and, and you know, the rest is history. And since then, we've grown and we've increased the, the length of the contracts and the prices and the, the bonus structures. So, the, the earning capacity for me is, it's up to me. I mean, I could work a lot more than what I'm doing now. I could do 12 hour days, not that I need to, but I could and, mm-hmm. and, you know, get upwards of that half a million dollars a year. So I think it's, it's just the excitement that every day you can make whatever you want and it's up to you and you know, you're going to get good quality leads and, and you know, they're going to be booked into your diary. And as a fitness salesperson, that's so, so rare. So I'm just lapping it all up. And, and I think I came in very hot at the start and probably haven't slowed down too much. Yeah. Well, I think it's important at this stage to give a bit of context because we want people to understand kind of how good you are. So, I mean, in terms of this, like roughly based on working with us so far, like what is your projected yearly income, if that's not too personal to ask? Uh, No, that's fine. Look, I think it's important to be transparent, you know, in in the sort of fitness industry and in the sales industry. So, if I keep going the way that I'm going over, say, a 12-month period, yeah, on track between 350 to 400 K a year. That's off the the old pricing structure, which we know we've just implemented something more. So yeah, well and truly upwards of 400 K with the new structure that we've just implemented. And obviously, you know, people can, again, balk at that and go, what the fuck? How are you guys paying this guy that much money? But the thing is like, you know, if you were to guesstimate your average revenue in sales that you actually make per week, roughly, what would that be? Um, It'd be around 70 K a week. Yeah. Yeah, it's so 70k revenue um, a week, and I guess when people ask the question, "Well, how can you guys pay me so well?" because you know at least sort of 50% of that's front end cash, you know, in in the bank, obviously paid in full. So <laughs> the system works really well now for us, I think. But but yeah, I'd say around 70 sort of k a week. So what's yeah. that over a year? I don't know. 
It's a lot. Yeah. My, my brain over is three mil, yeah. over three mil, I think I would say a year in yeah. projected revenue. Yeah, I think about, about three and a half mil. Yeah, just doing some quick math. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our system because actually we haven't really talked that much about our sales systems in this. So, I mean, one of the things that's important for the, the people to realize is that we actually do, we pay commission only for salespeople. We used to do hybrid. There's really three different models for paying salespeople. You can pay them a full-time mm-hmm. wage, which usually, in my opinion, attracts the lowest quality individuals because you're going to be paying them a security balance, but they get paid typically very similar if they do a good or a bad job. Then there's a hybrid system where you kind of, Technically, they're a full-time or a part-time employee, but you're giving them a bonus if they sell. Still has limitations because it's hard to attract high-quality individuals. And then you have commission only, which is for sales by far my favorite. And what I love about that system is it's a sink or swim culture, which is great. B and C players don't survive, or at least C players certainly don't. And A players and A plus players, if you want to call them that, are attracted because they have the ability to earn a lot of money. They ride the waves. They ride the wins and the losses that the company experiences. And what it does is it effectively strips your security blanket on the bottom end. If you have a shitty day or a shitty week, you're not getting paid. But if you kill it, and this is what you do every single day, every single week, every single month, is you know you get paid really, really, really well for doing that. So what are your thoughts on different pay structures? Like, Have you ever been on a full-time wage as opposed to commission only? And what, what did you think about the differences? Yeah, I have. And uh, and from a very young age, you know, I, I like to know exactly what I'm actually bringing in in terms of projected cash into a company. So I could see from a very young age, you know, you're what, you're 22 years old, you're a membership consultant, you're getting paid 45 grand a year and absolutely nothing in comms. And then you know that, you've, you know, even back then, I was still probably averaging sort of, well, it was about 80 sales a month. Yeah, then for those companies, that's still probably a meal or two. But commission structure is definitely the way to go, I would say. Like, obviously, it's really dependent on lead quality, which you guys have down packed to an absolute T. But if you can get volume and quality and you're a salesperson, go commission any day of the week because, you know, obviously, you're going to get paid a lot higher. There's less risk to the company. You actually have to do the work if you're a salesperson. So that's how you should be making your money anyway. I would rate commission, commission only all the way. And I I agree 100%. I think it's so important to attract the right people. And you want to really create in your pay scale, something that actually rewards the top performers heavily above the bottom performers. Because otherwise what you do is you create a system where the top performers are being punished and the underperformers are being rewarded. And it just doesn't make any sense. So you have to have that pay gap from, you know, in terms of the results. The other thing we do is we separate the type of sale and there's types of sales that we're really trying to push. Now, our favorite preferred option is basically a financed option. We use an Australian company called OpenPay that we're, we're trialing recently. What that does is it allows us basically to collect a lot more cash up front, obviously collecting cash up front, our usual standards as well. You know, you're very, very good at collecting both finance and cash up front, like paid in full payments. How do you go about that process and what's your kind of secret to that? Well, I think credit to them. You know, a lot of people, I think a lot of gym owners even and, you know, personal trainers, if they actually knew the opportunities that were out there now in, in today's mm. day and age with the technology and how yeah. easy things are, you know, they'd probably implement it themselves as well. But, you know, as we've established, it's, it's very similar to getting a six-month phone plan or, or getting a whatever it may be, a Netflix, no, not necessarily a Netflix subscription, but like a six-month um, phone plan or using Afterpay. So, it's very, very easy in terms of for the customer and for us as well. It also allows us to deliver our program to them, which is obviously a yep. six-month program. It gives them a little bit longer to pay for it. And I think it works really well because we are a premium service. And, you know, obviously not everyone can afford to do our program, which is fine, but they can if they can pay it off for a little bit longer. And that's where finance comes into play. So, but yeah, I think getting the balance of, you know, finance, your normal paid in fulls, and then your normal own direct debit members is is really, really vital, really, really important. Yeah, no, for sure. It's like, there's so many different ways that businesses can try and help themselves by collecting more cash up front. But also this is a really incentivized offer for you, the salesperson. As soon as we brought in financing for you to be able to collect more up cash up front for the company, we're obviously able to reward you more handsomely for doing that. So that's, I think that's what, creating a good culture is all about. You know, we're very fortunate with our sales culture. We have some amazing staff, yourself included. And I think one of the ways that that has to be managed is that you guys are very high quality people who need high quality working environment. So we have to make sure the opportunity is there, both financially and in terms of the culture. What are the things I'm really interested, you know, like, and I want you to be as honest about as you can. What are the things that you do like about working for us? And are there any things that you don't like? 
Yeah, so with you guys, I think from the get-go, there's been full transparency in terms of what we both expect and want out of each other as a, com- as, as a company versus myself. So that's what, obviously what I like. So, you know, I did come in maybe with a, a little bit of an attitude, sort of demanding things well, here or there. But... Should, we, should we actually talk about what happened quickly? Because that was a funny story. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but basically, yeah. I sort of got connected with uh, you through Gosen because, you know, he knew your uh, previous employer and, you know, good mates with him. And basically, at the time, I thought you were kind of coming in and trying to, you know, play hardball. So I basically told you to fuck off, not in so many words, but, you know, I pretty much wasn't that interested. And then it turns out that we kind of realized that we were actually just both probably very direct communicators, I would say. And so we kind of came back and sort of got it all sorted and happy days. Yeah. Yeah. He messaged me on a Friday night. Didn't get a response <laughs> by Monday morning. He said, don't fucking bother, mate. You're not good enough. <laughs> fucking all right. Yeah. I, I thought you were trying to flame me hot and cold. And anyway, it's really, it's really funny because we, you know, we have a r- real direct communication style and, you know, you've kind of held us to a really high standard. I mean, like, you know, you always say to AG, Hey man, where's my leads? Where's my damn leads, buddy? Give me some more. Give me more. I want to make you guys more money. I want to make me money. So we feel like with a with a high quality like staff member, you know, there's a sense of like mutual respect and responsibility. Like you're not basically someone that we're just telling what to do and we're like making you do whatever we feel like. You're like hungry to the extent that like we have to keep you, like we have to keep your resources ready to go. So you've got a packed calendar. And that's a responsibility and and, and I guess a level of stress that G feels is like, you know, you got to keep good quality people busy. And we really appreciate that sort of demanding presence. As long as it's done in a respectful way, it actually lifts the bar so that everybody in the team, you know, that whole Roger Bannister effect we mentioned earlier, everybody in our team pushes harder and expects more of themselves because of some of that discipline and the expectations that you brought in. Yeah, no, look, absolutely agree with that. I think obviously for gym owners that may listen to this and and potentially even salespeople, you know, especially if it's commission only or or even in any sort of pay structure, there needs to be a really clear sort of goal in mind that will support, I guess, the growth of both parties. Because when you're a salesperson, uh, especially if you're a hungry one that has been around for a little while and and has opportunities to work with people like yourself, you do need to be busy. You do need need the quality. You know, you're still expected to work for it, obviously, but... Mm. I mean, if, you know, if you only sit around with it with an empty diary two weeks in a row, you're, you're probably going to start looking elsewhere for some for some cash pretty quick. So, I just think having that mutual benefit for growth for each trajectory for the salesperson for the gym, expectations around what they can deliver for leads, expectations around what they can earn, bonus structures like it's all so important to keep your salespeople hungry, keeping yeah. them enticed to to show up, work, work for you directly, not work for themselves and. I wouldn't do, I love what I do with you guys, but I wouldn't do it for myself, even mm. though, okay, yeah, maybe potentially I could earn a little bit more, but everything else that comes with that, that's not the side of business that I want to be involved with. Yeah, that's really important as well. I, I agree. Like I used to work for a, a gym. I was a personal trainer there and I was just really a contractor. You know, there are a lot of things I really liked about that business. And there were a lot of things that just weren't really so great. The culture there wasn't so good amongst the staff. A lot of, you know, lacking respect, I thought, in some areas from the ownership to a lot of the staff. But one of the things that they really got wrong in their sales process is that they had a commission system that was infinitely infuriating to the, the salespeople because basically every month they performed and hit their quota. The quotas got raised. And so they only then got paid their commissions again if they continued to improve. So it was almost like every time their performance improved, they got punished. Not They got rewarded immediately. But then in the long sense, the next month, they got punished. And so one thing that you know is really important to you, you made it very clear when you came in, not that we didn't already have this, is that you wanted a predictable and reliable pay structure where you knew you got paid on this day. We were never going to be late in paying. There was always going to be this amount, all those kind of things. And you know, I think that's something that you have to do as well. You have to look after your people. And I learned that from working in that previous employment, just how important that was. Yeah. No, look, I totally agree. And any salespeople that are listening that have worked at gyms or done sales in the fitness industry before, I'm sure that, you know, nine out of 10 have probably been royally fucked when it comes to their commissions before. Yeah. And it is a really bad culture. And, you know, generally mm-hmm. in those sort of gyms, you get paid shit anyway. And then for them to do everything they can not to pay you, I just think, at the start of our relationship, we yeah obviously lay down those expectations and go like, I'm ready to go. I will work very hard and I'll make us obviously a lot of money. Like, let's give it a record crack, but this is sort of what I expect. And, and we agreed on that. And, and ever since then, you guys, you, you couldn't have been better. And I think 
that's a really important thing as well. I mean, <laughs> when you're paying out whatever it is, maybe 120, 130, 150 grand a commission a month, you guys are paying it out, you pay it out on that day. You know, people are getting getting their, their commissions on the day. There's no problems. You have great structures in place. That's just such a breath of fresh air for a salesperson. And mm. yeah, obviously, you know, not the main reason, but one of the reasons, yeah, I'm definitely still sort of here and ready to go and really excited mm. about the future. Yeah. No, which is great. So another thing that we use to motivate our staff, and I know it works for you because I've used it on you a number of times, is we have a lot of data tracking systems. And as somebody who likes to win very much, in fact, one of your most hated things that I've noticed is coming second. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I've, I've heard that guy, Matt Fraser off there, CrossFit things. He's like, yeah, I was the first loser. So no, but yeah. honestly though, like in your case, that's kind of the mindset that you have. It's very much that Michael Jordan sort of attitude where it's like nothing but winning is acceptable. And so every single time that we have a statistic or a metric that we're not happy about in the team, we actually create in our data tracking a, a way of tracking that data so that everybody has a scoreboard. We track close percentages. We track bad fit percentages. We track close percentages after bad fit to make sure that people aren't fudging. We check the no-show percentages because if someone has an unca- like a, a, a randomly high number of no-shows, maybe they're not answering their calls. You know, if someone's missing their calls because they're running late. We track paid in full collected, the number of open pays collected, like the the finance options. And I know for a fact that that motivates the heck out of you because every time there's a statistic that perhaps you're lacking in, all I have to do is add that to the (laughs) scoreboard and like you'll come second for one week and then the next week you're coming first again. Or you just leave your fucking cursor on there and then you just go off and do what you got to do for the day, knowing well and truly I'm going to see that. So that's what you do. You yeah. Leave your cursor so, my name. so I'll get a message from that's Ruben me saying, up. hey, get your fucking cursor off my like cash collected today, man. Like, <laughs> you know, like some, something like that, you know, but that's the thing. It's really, it's really interesting how having data, like as a motivated guy, legitimately though, all jokes aside, how important is that to you to actually have that kind of stuff to, to give you a, like a score? Yeah, well, it's extremely important. I've always gone in blind and there's, I've never really had access to that. You just keep your own sort of tally of your own sales or a big fuck off whiteboard with, you know, 20 other people that are selling as well. So having this, having this there to be able to analyze your own stats in real time and real life data to know exactly how many people you've, you know, how many people you've paid it, paid in full, how many people have you sold on the high end program, you know, how many on the lower end, how many people haven't shown just to understand your stats. I think as a salesperson, because leads, can come in on tap, you know, if we open up our hours, you know, a day in advance and sort of let G know. So I think it's really important that way you can start to predict how many sales you're going to get already just based on what's happening that week, right? Yep. So if you're going to get two no-shows, a couple of back pitch, make four sales, then you know, okay, well, I need to open up, you know, maybe six or seven, eight hours or something like that to be able to get your four sales minimum per day. So I think it's so important and it helps me and, yeah, definitely motivates the shit out of me. Yeah, Especially I mean, the commission structure stats that we've got. That one's even more motivating. That's the thing. I mean, honestly, like we joke about it, but I have used that many times to motivate you. Even if I didn't tell you, if there was a stat I wasn't happy about, I'd literally just make a loom saying, hey guys, this stat needs to be better for everybody. Create that stat. And then lo and behold, next week, Ruben's coming first in that stat. It's really interesting how people, how someone like yourself, because you're not a usual guy, you're a 26 year old that's making roughly 350K a year with probably now that we've created open pay, it's going to be more than that. I mean, that's you're not a normal person, and a lot of people look up to someone like you and go, "Well, how the sh- how the hell does that guy's mindset work?" There's definitely, you know, there's a bit of something different. You, you know, you're you're obsessed. You know, you, you're disciplined, and not everybody can cut that. But I think a lot of people are going to want to know what makes you tick, and I think statistics and winning is a huge part of it. It's mastering your craft, basically. Yeah, yeah, I think. Like, obviously, as I said, I have been doing this for about 10 years. And if I was to calculate it, or maybe I should try and do that one way or another, I've probably sold over at least 10,000 gym memberships or fitness programs in my time, if not more. So I think experience comes into play as well. Like, if you're a salesperson, you're trying to make it in the fitness industry. And and by make it, I mean, you know, over 100K, 200K, 300K a year. Mm -hmm. You have to have... You have to have drive, obviously. You have to have passion. You have to have willpower. You have to set yourself serious goals. You have to set you, you know, sort of go through how you can actually achieve those goals. And then you can start to predict your future and start to reverse engineer. You know, for myself, in the next three years, I want to have at least sort of seven figures, I would say, in investments or just, you know, in property or whatever that may look like. And it's extremely doable on track for that already with you guys. So that motivates me. It's like, cool, 30 three, just over three years, you know, that was my goal. I didn't think I'd hit that until maybe now, now this year, I'm like, well, I can actually make that happen. 
Yeah. So yeah, what makes me tick, I think it's just how good the opportunity is, especially at the moment, how much money I can make each day. If I was doing other things like watching Netflix or like doing absolutely fuck all, I mean, I could potentially miss out on making two grand a day, you know, mm-hmm. if I take a day off. So it, it's, it's quite, it's a curse in a sense because it, it's quite hard to even go on a holiday for a week mm-hmm. knowing, well, I could have made eight grand this week and then I've probably spent fucking five grand as well. But mm-hmm. I think that's good. It keeps you on your toes. It keeps you hungry. It keeps you wanting more because you just know how much you can make, you know, you know, you've, you've mastered your craft, you've mastered your routine, you've done it for so long. I think yeah. that's probably where I'm at at the moment. And then, yeah, having big, you know, big future goals as well, knowing that they're actually attainable, knowing the work that I've got to do between now and there to get there you know, in every way, shape and form. And, you know, as I said, not working for a day at the moment for me could cost me two grand. I mean, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a bit of fucking money, man. It's a, it's a crazy thing, you know, like one of the things I always like when you say to, to me or, or, or G or, or Sheree is that, you know, because you enjoy working for us so much and you really enjoy the culture, you can see that you're going to be on the journey with us, you know, for a long period of time. And that's something that we want to create for yourself and anybody that works with us. We're obviously very loyal to good quality, hardworking people that respect us, that respect the opportunity in the company. And then obviously we want to take people for a ride because it is really hard to find great staff. I mean, really great staff, you know, they're not they're not a dime a dozen, like, you know, they're rare. And so you have to find people and keep them once you actually get them. I think that's really, really important. So creating that sort of ability where someone like yourself can stay motivated, stay driven and feel like you've got that respect where you can actually be given the opportunity to cure, you know, your goals happen. Yeah. Super, super important. Now we've got a little bit of time left and I've got a couple more topics that I wanted to go over three, in fact. The next one is just really quick. So you're a guy, you're a young guy, in fact, and we sell mostly to women between the ages of 50 and 70. Now, there's a lot of people that would make excuses about that and say, man, I can't do that. I, I can't sell. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a woman. I don't understand their issues like menopause and things like that. So what do you think about those kind of excuses? <laughs> well, look, at the end of the day, especially if you're the salesperson, you're not, you're not there to understand all of their problems and create their solutions and do their programming and write the diet plans and do this mm-hmm. and that. That's not your job at all. You're there to analyze their situation. You're there to dissect what's been happening, especially if they're women age 50 to 70. You know, what's been Mm -hmm. happening for the last 30 or 40 years? What's led you here? Why haven't you got it right? That's what you're there to do. You're there to have a conversation with them to figure out what's gone wrong. Why Mm -hmm. does it keep going wrong? We have a solution that we believe in that we can fix it. You deliver what, what that solution is. And then you close them into a deal by selling them the solution that is clearly there for them that they've never had before. Mm-hmm. So that's the way that I go about it. You're going to get some pushback, pick up the phone and, and someone's like, I thought I was speaking to a female and, you know, you just crack a little joke. Look, unfortunately, I'm definitely not a female, uh, you know, something like that. But, you know, I'm here to help you take you through your call today. And, and if it is something that you're wanting to do, we can push you forward with a female coach. Yep. So you just overcome that. You just overcome that, uh, you yeah. know, very, very easily with confidence, with authority. Yeah, for, me, for mine, it's a very easy one to overcome. I think that's it. I think like people, you know, I've done it before many times. I still do it today. I mean, you've come up with reasons why, logical reasons in your mind, kind of like logical fallacies. Look, this makes sense. This won't work. And most of those things are bullshit. You know, when you really look at it, you go, well, you know, that's not true. I'm just creating excuses. I notice that it happens in business all the time. It's not just sales. It's in marketing. It's in branding. It's in sales. It's in delivering the program. People come up with excuses that basically limit their success because they are always, you know, looking to get all their ducks in a row kind of thing. And I think like you just, you know, although we have many fantastic male salespeople, in fact, most of our team in in sales is males. I just want to make sure that the listeners don't create these excuses in their minds. You know, if you have the desire to do something, chances are you're going to be able to do it if you actually apply yourself. Yeah. Yeah, no, look, absolutely. And again, it's just about telling them what you're there for, making sure that they feel comfortable, making sure that they're in a position where they can trust you to proceed with the call. So, Mm. you know, straight away by saying, look, I completely understand where you're coming from. I know that you may have thought that we'd be speaking about, say, menopause today, but that won't necessarily be the case. Mm -hmm. Let's just speak about what's going on in your life what has been going on and how we can create those solutions for you. So I think, you know, it's just about overcoming and making them feel comfortable. And again, not freaking Mm. out or losing composure. You're literally having a conversation with someone that does not know who the fuck you are. Like there's nothing scary about that. Do you know what I mean? So you're just having a, there's no humility. Even if they tell you to fuck off or they yell at you, which, you know, rarely ever, ever happens, like doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. There's no, they don't know you. You're speaking generally over the phone or even on Zoom. 
Mm. You know, you just have to have a conversation. You've just, but for me, it's like talking to, you know, if this was my mum, how would I, how would I chat to her? How would I help her if she mm. was in this health position at the moment? Yep. Um, and you just have a conversation and, and you have a good conversation and you create the right solutions and, and they'll buy it. Most of the time they'll buy it because they can afford to do so. I think there's a huge amount of power in what you said. I mean, honestly, like sales is about not being reactive, right? It's about, you know, being able to change someone because of your non being reactive. So if someone's getting feisty and cranky at you, there's no point, you know, being that person that goes kind of angry back. I mean, let's say you're, you're at the supermarket, for example, and like the, the supermarket, like the, the clerk, for example, they're having a shitty day. So, you know, they're like next, you know, like what? And then they, they're all cranky. I mean, you can obviously be cranky back and then you're both going to have a shitty experience or you can have a smile on your face and just ask them about their day. And, you know, you change, change their day. Like it's one's a much more enjoyable experience. And I think when it comes down to sales, you know, people have to be non-reactive to people's moods. They have to be non-reactive to objections, you know, not take things personally. And you have a much more enjoyable experience as a result of that. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to believe in what you're selling as well. So I think that's course, really yeah. important. You have to believe in what you're selling. You have to know that your product works. You know, you have to know that you're actually creating them a good solution. And especially in the health and fitness industry space, like unless you're, yeah. you know, coaching specified athletes, yeah. I mean, they're coming to you because they're not fucking happy. So... To expect them to be happy to speak to you about why they're not happy is just, yeah. it's, it's just absurd. Like it's, it's not going to happen. You know, a lot of the time, especially when we're dealing with women who may be divorced or have health issues or overcome cancer or have thyroid issues or you know have this or that and that going wrong. They've cared for everyone else and now they now they hate themselves. You know, you have to mm-hmm. have to come from a place of compassion. You don't have to be a pushover. You don't have to accept their excuses, but you do have to come from a place of compassion. Make them feel comfortable. Create the appropriate solutions for them and overcome it that way because if you, if you meet fire with fire with a 50 year old lady on the phone you're never going to fucking win that's for sure mm. no i i agree man like we're kind of like touching on another one of my topics i've got left and i think this one's a really fascinating one so as a person who has a really high close percentage how do you balance close percentage i.e like getting most people that you speak to to make a, a yes decision and ethics so what i mean by that is like there are some sales people out there in the world that will sell people things that they don't need for their own benefit. How do you balance that? Because obviously there's always going to be objections. And part of selling is, is kind of making a decision about who should be in the program from an ethical standpoint. Well, I think for most people it is. I'm interested in your take on that. Yeah. Well, not you can't help everyone. And that's been known for ages. You cannot simply help everyone. You mm-hmm. know, with health and fitness, to some extent, you obviously can. But mm-hmm. ours is a very specified program targeting you know, certain areas that women need to improve. So in terms of ethically selling everyone, I think, you know, what we have really well is we have multiple different programs. So it's generally the financial hurdle or someone just comes to us, you know, comes to us randomly and, you know, that, you know, they've got to put on weight or something like that. They don't need weight loss, right? So mm. that's generally the only two times where I, where I won't put them through. If they physically <laughs> can't afford, you know, a small amount and it's actually going to put them in financial stress, well, then that's not a good option for them. That's going to create conflict in their life. That's not great at all. It's going to give them a bad experience. So you own that one. You don't sell that one. Mm-hmm. It is what it is. You you tell them to go to the GP, see a dietitian, get some sessions that way, right? And then, yeah, ethically as well. So if they, if they need to put on weight, if, if you generally feel like your program can't deliver them any more than what they're already doing, yeah, you have the to result be honest. Want. You just have to be honest and you say, look, uh, I'd advise you maybe go to your GP, get some tests. You know, if it's hormonal, if they come back from chemo, if they've, I'm dieting, I'm eating 1,600 calories, I'm training, you know, six times a week, I'm doing an hour of cardio, I'm drinking enough water, I'm doing everything I can, and you actually believe them, then, you know, maybe it's not the right thing to do to sell them into a program or still offer them the chance to give it a go anyway, but, you know, leave it up to them instead of you trying to make that push and, and sell on emotion. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've I found that a lot of salespeople, we're really talking to a very small percentage on that one. There are some people that do that. They're good enough to sell people that shouldn't be into a program and they do that, which obviously that's not ideal. The thing that actually happens to most people, interestingly, is that they have a real problem with selling because they feel sleazy, they feel dirty, and they don't want to sell people because they're like, oh, maybe maybe that person didn't need the program. Maybe it's too much money. And, and so they make themselves a bad salesperson because of their attitude. And the way that we kind of address that, and I think every good salesperson will probably have this same paradigm, is you have to understand that the way to balance ethics and sales quality is to understand that you're entering every call not for your benefit, but for the benefit of the prospect. So it's not about collecting your commissions. Yeah, sure, that gets you, that drives you, but you want to make sure that you're having impact in an ethical manner. So 
if somebody tells you like, I'm going to die, or like, you know, my, my dad passed away when he was 50 and I'm 45 and I'm, you know, I've, I've already had my first heart attack. Oh, it's too expensive. You know, you, you don't want to let that person get off the phone because it's like that person could die or that person could be in a position where they're, you know, in a wheelchair or they've got chronic pain, you know, or they have shitty self-confidence and they basically just hermit themselves in their house for the rest of their life. That's why I love generating such powerful emotional anchors for a sale, because what it does is as a salesperson, it helps you fight for that sale for their benefit. And I think the only time I won't sell somebody is, as you said, basically, if I consider it unethical to do so, because they genuinely don't have the means, and I mean genuinely. And the other thing is that what they want, the result that they want, isn't something that we are actually well-placed to provide. Now, typically, that doesn't happen very often, but maybe about one in 10 calls, maybe one in, maybe, maybe you know, even 15%, there are people that probably shouldn't be doing the program, and we obviously make an effort not to sell them. Yeah, yeah, no, that's obviously a small minority, but again, I think it's really important just to say it again. People that don't feel ethical about what they're selling or feel awkward when it comes to pushing them a little bit in the right direction towards the end of the sale call, um, you know, think about this person is on the call with you for a reason, obviously. Yeah. Um, if this was your mum or your brother or your sister or yourself, if you were 20 kilos overweight, you know, would it be the right thing to do to have that push? They clearly need a push, otherwise, mm-hmm. they would be where they are already. So it is your job to, first of all, deliver a great conversation, a very good conversation where you're uncovering everything. And if you've got that right, it will feel natural and you won't feel like a sleazy fuck um, because you've just had a good conversation. Mm -hmm. You've found their pain points. You've found the solutions. They feel comfortable about it. You ask them how they're feeling about it. They say they're excited. Then you get over that financial hurdle. Look, not everyone has has you know money, but if your program's ranging from a hundred, you know, fifty dollars to one hundred and seventeen a week, or whatever it may be, I mean, most people can generally make that work, right? You break it down daily, you break it down hourly, right? So, what would it be? A seven dollars, fifty dollars a week, like seven dollars an hour, like one dollar an hour type thing in terms of your eight-hour working day? Can you afford one dollar an hour? You can break it down like that if you need to. Yeah, they're on the call with you for a reason. Treat it like it was your family member you have a job to actually do by helping them and getting them over the line. But it starts, you know, it starts from the very start of the phone call. I think if you're overcoming too many hurdles and you're feeling a little bit awkward, then maybe you haven't done your console right. Yeah, no, very, very, very good points. Last question, man. You have very good, what I'm going to call sales fitness. And what I mean by that is probably better than anyone I've met in fitness sales. You know, we're doing 30 minute back-to-back calls here. It can be very draining. I feel I get that from our staff. I also get that from our mastermind members who sell. How do you turn up and back up every call? And often you'll do like an eight to 10 hour day. How do you do that? I, yeah, obviously structuring, you know, my own health and my own training and my own well-being. Mm -hmm. They're all very real and important things. I prefer to do that, you know, just eight hours, pretty much back to back, half an hour calls, get fully booked because, I just feel like once you get a roll going, once you get some momentum going, once your commission starts to add up and you can really set yourself up for the day from the get-go, it's just extremely motivating for me. Mm. Again, yeah, I don't necessarily get tired. I think maybe because I'm closing people in 20 minutes as well, you always get a bit of a 10-minute break. Yeah. But for, for me, it's just like I'd like to do it. I couldn't do split shifts in terms of sales. Just one eight-hour day. Cool. My goal is to make you know at least five or six sales. I want to make two grand mm. commission for the day. And this is the way that it's going to go. And, you know, you've got your monthly goal, you've got your weekly goal, your daily goal, and, and that's sort of how I set myself up. Yeah, I don't necessarily get fatigued, I wouldn't say, but I, I just think it's because the opportunity, like, you don't know when opportunities are going to change. You know, you guys, you're not going to, obviously, but you could close your company tomorrow and this, and, and where else am I going to make two grand a day? So you have to just seize every opportunity that you've got. And for yeah. someone like myself that's been doing it for so long that hasn't earned mm-hmm. two grand a day before... I mean, why the fuck wouldn't I? I can work from home. I can work from the beach with my laptop and my phone. I can, it's just the opportunity is so good not to take it so seriously and, and do what you need to do every single day. Yeah. You know what I would put it down to you as well is that I think you, the first thing you said about the 20-minute calls, because that's very unique. And you know, a lot of people come into our mastermind having done sales trainings with other sales mentors and coaches, and their selling takes 45 to 60, sometimes even 90 minutes, which I think is absurd. And there's no doubt in my mind that longer calls are more draining because you've got to put more into them. And you might go through 45 minutes of chatter to get a no decision. Whereas in your yeah. case, having that time that you can get up, stretch your legs, go to the bathroom, make yourself a cup of coffee, whatever it is, you know, 
the fact that you're closing people in 20 minutes and you're able to do that, it shows how important brevity is on calls. And most importantly, not talking about yourself. No one gives a shit about you on a call, right? So it's like, yeah. if you if you can cut that out of your process, you've got 30 minute blocks, you're closing them in 20 minutes, they're happy. You've got five to 10 minutes to go and do your thing. What I think really burns people out is going back to back to back to back with no break. And anybody on our team whose calls are slightly longer, they're the people that get the most mentally, emotionally, and physically fatigued. Yeah, back to back to back to back to no to no to no to no. And oh. of course, you're going to be fucking drained. You're having long yeah. conversations that aren't making you any money and you're not finding solutions for the prospect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just a waste of time. In my opinion, no sale that is, say, under three grand in the fitness industry should go any longer than half an hour. Yeah. It doesn't make sense, especially if it's a longer contract. Like your upfront payments, obviously, maybe, but your contracts, it, it just yeah. should not take longer than half an hour. It just makes no sense. How long does it take to ask them a few questions, That's create it. a solution for them, make them feel comfortable, make them laugh, make them feel excited about what their first seven days looks like and take yep. payment. It doesn't take long. Well, there's only two reasons that I've found why calls go longer than that. It's because either the person is going off on tangents and if they're going off on tangent, that means that the salesperson is letting them do that. The other thing is, as I said, and this is a major sin in selling, is that the person, the salesperson is just talking about themselves too much. I've heard a lot of time when somebody says something and they go, oh yeah, that happened to me too. And I'm like, just don't say those sort of things. Like the, it's irrelevant. Like all you're doing yeah. is asking them questions about themselves, digging, creating an emotional anchor, providing a solution. That's it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, like, I think, you know, rapport building, you can drop one or two rapport building lines, but it shouldn't be all the time. It shouldn't be every single sentence relating it back to you and your story. Like it's not about you. They booked a, they booked a call with you because they need help from you. You're there to deliver their solution you know, not talk about yourself and, and, and whatnot. Okay. So I definitely agree with that as well. And I think to have their attention for 45 minutes to be emotionally invested for 45 minutes is a stretch. Like you're having a phone call with them or whether it's face-to-face -face or Zoom, you're wanting them to be engaged for like 45 minutes and be mm -hmm. emotional the whole time and, and hold yeah. that same emotional level about what they're wanting to achieve. Yep. That's too long. That's it also dilutes the long. quality of the call. Because what happens is people aren't all great audio learners right so I, i'm not a good audio learner if i'm if i'm like trying to learn from like podcasts and stuff or, or not or not even podcasts because they're conversational but more like say audiobooks it doesn't work for me so interesting i'm a salesperson the way i sell is i'm very kinesthetic i'm taking notes pen and paper that kind of shit and that allows me to focus but i think like when you speak for too long what happens is too many things get discussed and now the person doesn't even remember why they need to do this it becomes really really tough for them to fit that in and the other thing as well is like everyone who does long calls has experienced this, you know, they're just about to close someone and then, oh, hang on a second, I've got to go. And so the more you lengthen out a call, the more you're playing with fire. What if somebody comes to the door? What if their, you know, their son calls them and is having an emergency and they've got to rush off? Next thing you're left there, you know, basically, oh, well, I didn't get the card, you know? So the shorter you can wrap things up, as long as you do it succinctly and you get all of their needs taken care of, it's always going to be superior. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that because, yeah, there, there will be distractions and, you and you know, 20 minutes to half an hour for me is the sweet spot and has worked yeah. well and I never have a problem. And then when you even look at retention, I've got one of the better retention rates as well in terms of clients not cancelling. So I think that's, you know, you don't need 45 minutes just to keep them accountable. You're not going to keep them accountable for the next 26 weeks. That's not your job, you know, in our program, for instance. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Look. Man, it's been a cracker of an episode. I think people listening should have got a huge amount of value out of this. Just what makes you tick and a little bit about, you know, even how our systems work. We'll definitely get you on again sometime in the not too distant future. Appreciate you coming on and uh, yeah, go, go make some money.